when the space shuttle goes up, it's only, I don't know, a few hundred miles above the, the surface of the Earth. It doesn't have to go very far, and you're out in outer space. The atmosphere is actually very wide when you go horizontally. You can't leave the atmosphere by walking. But if you were to go straight up, you punch through so much different kinds of weather, and pretty soon you're in outer space, just a few miles above us there. So, I mentioned that uh, they don't really have hot air balloons that go up eight miles, and so if you get a hot air balloon ride, there's no danger that you're going to be uh, turned into a popsicle up there. But, it's, we really do know, when I used that example from Austin, Texas, I went on the internet and found actual weather data from those elevations up in the atmosphere. Where did that data come from? And if there was real data, why would anybody want to go measure that stuff? Well, it just so happens that in the weather business, if you want to do a forecast for your town, for your village, and you say, what's the weather going to be like tomorrow? In order to do that, the first thing you need to know is, well, you need to know what's happening now at your village, but also you need to know what's happening way up high in the atmosphere. Because you remember that business about 104 miles an hour? That's what they call the jet stream. That's an important high-speed river of air that pushes high and low-pressure systems around. The jet stream makes our weather. That is the steering flow you got to know where that jet stream is if you're going to do a weather forecast. So how do you do that? you got to go find the jet stream by launching not a hot air balloon, but a weather balloon. There really are weather balloons. They're not just for conspiracy theories anymore. And I happen to bring a weather balloon into this very room here. I had to deflate it in order to get it through the door because it's huge. But here we go. And can we, we'll see if we can get this on here. You are about to see a real live weather balloon. Look at this thing. It, there's no air in it right now. You ever have a birthday balloon that was this big? Check it out. You could even climb in here if you wanted, I suppose. Maybe it's waterproof. This is where they get wetsuits from. Okay, this is an actual weather balloon. Here's the nozzle on the bottom. And you know what they do? They fill this up with uh, helium. Helium is one of those lighter than air gases, so even if it's not warm, it'll still rise. And that's what they put into birthday balloons and such. When I was at, out at Nome with the Weather Service, we put hydrogen in our balloons, which, and the problem is the word hydrogen rhymes with the word Hindenburg. And I was always nervous about hydrogen because it's highly flammable. But, but helium is one of those noble gases. They call them noble gases because like the nobility, they don't really do anything. They're non-reactive. And so helium's nice and safe. And now we put helium in all the balloons. You fill this thing up with helium down here at the end, then you tie it off, and this thing gets huge. It's all full of helium. And then you let it go, boop, and it's lighter than air, so it floats up. And what's on the other end of the string? Well, you get the big orange thing here. This is actually a parachute. And what's on the other end of the parachute is, ta-da! Here's the reason we launch these weather balloons. This little guy here, this is called, this is the big scientific word here, a radio sound. Also uh, affectionately known as the instrument. Inside this little tiny box, and I'll tell you here, it hardly weighs anything. You'd think there's really nothing there. But inside of here, they have packed a temperature sensor, a humidity sensor, a air pressure sensor, and a radio transmitter. Here's a little radio transmitter down here sticking out of the bottom. Anyway, all of those pieces of equipment are crammed into here. It's packed by styrofoam, and it's very lightweight. The, reasons that, the reason it's lightweight is that if an airplane hits this thing, this is going to break, and the airplane won't, because this is, the mass is spread out over a much bigger package than it really needs to be, so it's not dense. It has low density, and it's going to shatter. So anyway, you launch this balloon, up it goes, doo -doo 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 -doo. it's transmitting data back down to the ground. You're at the ground listening, and you got your little dials, and, doo -doo 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 -doo. and you hear what it says, and it's like, yes, the temperature is 62 degrees, and it goes up further. Yes, the temperature is 42 degrees, and it goes up further. Yes, temperature is 38 degrees, and it's very humid, and it's very windy. This thing tells all the information to us down on the ground, and we go, oh, that's very interesting. And then when this thing finally comes up, and it says, you know what, it's 104 miles an hour of wind out there, then we go, ah, it has hit the jet stream. And that's what we needed to know in order to make our weather forecasts. So again, the idea that the weather changes a lot when you go up, it's just kind of interesting, it's kind of fun to think that you can be sitting outside on a nice day and you look up and it's clear blue skies and you think, you know, even though there's no wind down here now, it might just be a hundred and something miles an hour of wind just a few miles above my head. That's kind of interesting, but it's also meaningful. You need to know this stuff if you're going to do the weather forecast. And here's how you find out. Because it's hard to see by the human eye. You know, you go outside and you watch the clouds and they move. 
the clouds are moving because the wind is pushing them around. And there are times when at the ground there's no wind, but you look up and the clouds are really booking. And you think there must be a lot of wind up there. What's even more fun is some days when you look up and there's two layers of clouds, and one underneath is going one way, and the one above that's going another way, maybe at different speeds. And you think, well, boy, there must be all kinds of wind up there pushing the clouds around if they're moving differently like that. And this weather balloon, one, two, three, that guy will tell us exactly what's going on. And you may wonder, why the orange parachute? You got balloon, balloon, parachute, instrument. Why the parachute in between? Well, the idea there is that eventually all whatever goes up must come down. So this balloon, as it goes up and up and up, the pressure, the air pressure around the balloon gets less and less and less as you go higher. So the balloon stretches, 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 and we'll see what breaks here. Ah, it's going to be me. Okay, I couldn't do it. This is tough material. It stretches out. It gets as big as a, a house, actually, a, a multi-story building. This fabric can stretch out so far, but you can't stretch it forever. And it gets high up there many miles. We went up to eight miles high in this little example here. Well, this thing can go 12, maybe 15 miles high before finally the fabric gets stretched so far that boop, it rips somewhere, it pops, and then what goes up must come down. That's where the parachute comes in. So if one of these things hits you on the head, keep in mind that it is, uh, it's not very dense. It hardly weighs anything. And the parachute, once it starts coming down, see if this will work. The parachute opens up like that and catches the air, so that limits how fast that bugger can fall. And if it hits you on the head, guaranteed no life-threatening injury will result. You know, one really fun thing, too, is that if you, if you find one of these things, because they launch them every day, there's two of these that are launched every day out of Nome, out of Kotzebue, out of Bethel, out of McGrath, St. Paul Island launches these, launches these, although I think almost all of those go in the water. But when, they, when the balloon pops and it falls, people find these things. And inside is a little tiny envelope like this. This is an actual envelope from an actual radio sound. See, look at that. Postage paid. Costs you nothing. You put this little guy inside this envelope here, just like that. You can keep the balloon for yourself. And mail it up. Cut the, cut the umbilical cord there pop this in the mail, and we will uh, re we'll rebuild this unit and use it again. And they call that a reconditioned instrument. When I was out in Nome, that's all we used was recycled, reconditioned instruments. So it's nice. We can use them again and again and again as long as they survive their trip, you know, up into 100 mile an hour, 50, 100 below zero, and then they come back down. It's kind of hard on the equipment, but we'll reuse it as long as it keeps working. And at no cost to you, this saves tax dollars when we reuse those things. So, and believe it or not, people do find them around Nome. When I lived down in Nome, we had people who would bring them in. And so that was good. Okay, now what are we doing for time here? Oh, so we've been 23 minutes. Do, 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 do. So that's a weather balloon. Okay, now we're going to move on to... Ah, yes. In summary, our beautiful planet Earth has a lot of different kinds of weather on it. Something for everybody. Different people like different things, and this planet can provide just about any combination of weather, humidity, wind, temperature that you would want to find. But all those, those differences on a horizontal scale going from Alaska to Hawaii and such, that's nothing compared to what this planet can pull off just by going a few miles in the vertical. That's the big lesson here. If you don't like the weather where you are, just go up a few miles, and it's totally different. Now, it's hard to go up. You know, we don't allow ladders to go eight miles. But... It's, all, it's up there for the taking. And you can think to yourself, well, how has this ever been demonstrated in, in our own lives? There are a few examples that I came up with. I was just thinking about this. You ever fly on an airplane and you take off, and you might notice that your ears pop a little bit? That's because the airplane goes up. We talked about the, the temperature changing as you go higher, uh, the wind's changing as you go higher. Another thing that changes is the pressure. Air pressure, you don't really notice it around us, but even right now, there's all kinds of air pressing down around us all the time, pressing in from all sides, so we don't really notice it. But you do notice it somewhat when it changes. You go up in an airplane, and the pressure is less the higher you go up, and so your ears pop a little bit. That's an example of the weather changing in the vertical dimension. If you ever go to a big city, too, um, I went to Minneapolis one time, and they have the IDS building there. I don't even know what IDS stands for. To me, it stands for really tall building, because it's like 80 stories tall. You get in there, and you can ride the elevator, and they have a fast elevator that goes all the way to the top. And 
when you're in that elevator, the, your ears will pop, which is pretty neat. It's even more fun when it goes down, because if you jump at just the right time, just as the elevator starts and you jump, you kind of float for about half a second, which is kind of just like a ride. Then um, another thing, if you get on an airplane and it's a really cloudy day, say, um, this happens a lot up on the North Slope if it's Barrow and there's clouds and flurries and the wind is out of the east at 10, 15 miles an hour or something, a little bit of snow all the time. It looks really gray out there. You get on the air taxi, plane takes off, and you go through the clouds. And then let's say, here's your cloud layer. The airplane punches through there and now you're above the clouds. And all of a sudden, it's a beautiful day out there. And you thought, wait a minute, just two minutes ago it was foggy and snowy and cloudy, everything looked all great. And then you get up there and it's beautiful blue sky and the sun is shining. Again, there's very different weather from being on the ground to being just a little bit above the ground. And then the last example of real life here in Alaska, how temperature changes in the vertical dimension, is um, this isn't so much an issue on, on the coast of Alaska, but in the interior, one thing in the wintertime that happens all the time is this thing that they call the temperature inversion. And what does that mean? That means it's really cold down in town, down along the river valley, it's really cold. But if you go up in the hills, it's a lot warmer, maybe 20 or 30 degrees warmer, just by going up. Here in Fairbanks, there's Esther Dome. If you go up on top of there, it might be 30 degrees warmer than it is down, down in town in Fairbanks where almost everybody lives. So that's another example of how quickly things can change in the vertical. Well, Mary Pat, I think I've told you far more than I know, and I've babbled on to, through the full time. And I believe that's it. I'll hand it back to you. Well, thank you, Eric, and we appreciate your lecture today. A very good one. And we do have some questions before we open up to the um, public, the schools out there. The first one, is the temperature up above the earth ever warmer than on the ground? Oh, it is. In fact, what I was just mentioning, so the question is, is the temperature higher up ever warmer than it is on the ground? Yeah, that example we saw from Austin, Texas weather balloon where it got colder and colder and colder and colder when you went up higher. So the question is, are there ever times where you go up higher and then it gets warmer? What I was just mentioning about the temperature inversion, that's exactly, the, that's why they have the word inversion, because of the normal change of the higher you go, the colder it gets. That, that tendency is inverted. Instead of getting colder the higher you go, it gets warmer the higher you go. So that does happen here in, in Alaska, in the interior, happens all the time in the winter. Another thing is if you go way high, if you go... 20, 30, 40, 50 miles high in the atmosphere, you get through um, our part of the atmosphere, which we call the troposphere, and you get in the stratosphere. And in the stratosphere, temperatures, again, warm with height. How high do weather balloons go? They go until they pop. Um, so, ha ha. Oh, to tell you the truth, um, say 12 to 15 miles might be an upper limit. It's highly variable, though, um, depending on your balloon. We need a weather balloon to go up at least about five miles or else the, we don't have enough data. And so sometimes the balloons pop before um, they, they reach five miles up and then we have to make another, we have to fill up another balloon and relaunch it because you got to get up that high in order to get all the data that you need. A good way to think of it though generally is that weather balloons go up to about the same elevation even a little bit higher than jet airplanes. If you were to take a jet aircraft from say Anchorage down to Seattle or somewhere like that and how high up those jets go, you're even flying up and above uh, Denali, that's about the elevation of a weather balloon. It's way up there. What's the furthest uh, distance away from a launch site a weather balloon has been found? Wow, that's a great question. You know if a weather balloon gets caught in the jet stream and then it doesn't pop for a while, especially if sometimes these balloons they don't really burst open, they, get, they develop a slow leak and so the balloon just kind of hovers there for quite a while. If it does that, and it's in the jet stream, booking along at 150 miles an hour, um, it, could, it could be way out there. We, we could, from Fairbanks, send a balloon all the way into Canada. Um, theoretically, I, I don't know, though, to tell you the truth. There's a legend, though, out at Nome. Nome's a pretty windy place, but this is what they told me. Maybe they tell this to the new guy to make fun of him, but when I first got to Nome, they told me a story. of One day, they launched the weather balloon, it was a beautiful sunny winter day, high pressure, no wind anywhere. And the balloon went up, 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 it went straight up. Found no wind, kept going up, no wind. Up, 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 no wind. Went way up there, went miles high. They're watching the binoculars. 
and they saw it pop. And it came down and it landed right there at the Nome Airport where they launched it from. So it went nowhere um, in the horizontal sense. It went up several miles and then came down, but basically went nowhere. So I, anything is possible. I wish I had an answer to that, though. How far? I, I, it's got to be hundreds of miles, though. Another question is, is this weather balloon system used all over the world, or is it just the U.S.? Mm -hmm. It's used all over the world, and this is really a good example of international cooperation. It seems you turn on the TV and all you ever see is international conflict, but there's good cooperation around the world. All over the world, at 3 in the morning Alaska time and 3 in the afternoon Alaska time, these weather balloons are launched. All countries, Africa, Asia, United States, South America, all over the place, people launch these balloons, and they share the data internationally because weather is very connected. And you, what good does it do if we know the jet stream over the United States, but we don't know what it is over Russia? We need to know these things. So the data is shared. And so what's so special about three in the morning and three in the afternoon? It just so happens that that is the agreed upon universal time. That corresponds to midnight and noon uh, Greenwich Mean Time, Greenwich, England, where that happens to be the most important clock in the world, I guess. So we're coordinated based on Greenwich time to do that. What happens to the balloon if it gets hit by an airplane or if the plane will be okay? Yep, the plane will be okay. I had mentioned earlier that in this package, I wish we could have a way for you guys to touch this because this is so lightweight. This instrument is very light and it, uh, if an airplane, let's say up at the front of the airplane, that the nose of the plane slammed right into this box, that this box would break apart. There's really not much here. It only weighs a couple of ounces. So the, believe me that um, the aviation safety, um, FAA, the government would not allow us to throw these things into the air if they were going to be a hazard to aviation. And when I was working out in Nome launching these balloons, every day before the launch, I would I was all ready to launch the balloon. I had the balloon all gassed up and, and the, everything was ready to go and the signals were transmitting. Before I launched the balloon, I would have to coordinate with the tower to make sure they had no flights coming in at that time. And sometimes I would have to wait, you know, just wait five minutes for Alaska Airlines flight or whatever, Cape Smyth Air or something to come in and land. And then after they were done, I could launch the balloon because you want to avoid a collision. But if there is a collision, the plane will always win. That's how it's designed. Is a temperature difference as you go up greater during the summer than the winter? For example, a 90 degree day in Fairbanks in the summer to a minus 50 degree day in the winter, how much change would there be eight miles up in the atmosphere? Wow, that's a great question. Uh, no hard questions are allowed, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, in answer to that though, you're right, in the winter time, sometimes when we get really cold, I mean a serious winter cold outbreak, um, the last one that we had here was like the 1999 cold snap was a good one. Some of the weather balloon data from that show very little temperature change with height, not because it's warm aloft, but it's just so cold down at the ground that you launch your balloon and it goes up, and then it gets into air that's always cold anyway, so the contrast is, is less in the winter. Actually, it's down, I, I picked the Austin, Texas balloon because you tend to have more contrast in those warm places. Because everywhere on the earth, it's really cold upstairs. But if you uh, start at, at a place that's warm down at the surface, that's where you get your greatest contrast, is in the warm areas. And so that would mean here in Alaska, too, in the summertime, we, have, we tend to have greater contrast than in the winter. You know, who invented the weather balloon, and when did the weather balloon system start? Wow. Who invented the weather balloon? I have no idea. Maybe this gets back to that story about Benjamin Franklin with his kite. But I, I don't know the answer to that. That's a good question. Here in Alaska, with regard to the second part of that question, when did balloons start? I can say that in Alaska, our weather balloon program began just after World War II. It was 1948. How many weather balloons are launched across the world in a day? Holy cow. How many weather balloons are launched across the world in a day? Um, hundreds, maybe thousands. We can just keep this in mind. So Alaska, I mean, Alaska is a, a big state and all that, but it's only a small part of the whole globe. You know, so here's the whole world again, and Alaska is this one little place. And let's see, in Alaska, there are weather balloons launched at Barrow, Kotzebue, Nome, McGrath, Fairbanks, Bethel, St. Paul, King Salmon, Cold Bay, Kodiak, Anchorage, Yakutat, Annette, and 
Atu or Shimia out on the, the western tip. So that's 14 balloons in Alaska. They do it twice a day, so 28 balloons. So just in tiny Alaska here, there's 28 balloons launched every day. I would estimate then that across the whole world, there's got to be a, a few thousand maybe that go up every day all over. And you can't forget the southern hemisphere too. In fact, the old uh, weather service buddy of mine is now in, at the South Pole in Antarctica. He's been launching balloons down there for a whole year. Uh, he's, they're going to spring them free. He might just be leaving <laughs> right now. He's getting out of there after a winter. But they launch weather balloons all over. However, there's less balloons. You see, uh, see this thing? There's a big empty, the Pacific Ocean. There's not much weather data out there because there, there are some balloons launched from ships and from Hawaii and Guam. The islands launch balloons, but there's less data out there as well. But, you know, another good question. I don't know the specific answer to that, but it's got to be maybe a few thousand balloons launched worldwide every day. Is there a central location where the uh, data can be found from the weather balloons in both the northern and southern hemisphere? Yes, there are a couple places on the internet where you can find weather balloon data. And maybe, Mary Pat, I could get you the URLs to those places okay. and you could email them out maybe. But there's, there's um, University of Wyoming, maybe you could Google for that. University of Wyoming Atmospheric Science Department has a great website with weather balloon data archived on there. They go back at least into the 1990s with their weather balloon data archive. And you might want to Google for the word RAOB, too. R-A-O-B is a, a word that will help you find things. So University of Wyoming website. And then the National Weather Service, or NOAA, the parent agency of the Weather Service, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, they have a website as well where you can get the current weather balloon data as well as archived weather balloon data. And I even brought with me... You, know, you can get the weather balloon that looks like this. It's just columns of numbers, you know. That This I got from the NOAA website that I just mentioned. This is the, the weather balloon out of Texas from yesterday that I used in the presentation. But you can also get the display to be a, a nice graph that shows in a picture what's going on. And that sometimes that's easier to interpret. These okay. are great questions. How much does the um, instrument cost? You know, I have no idea. I hope it doesn't cost too much. Well, you know, in the government, maybe they spend $20,000 each. I have no idea how much they cost. I, I should know that. But they, um, we try to save money by using them again. And that also reduces the amount of waste out, in the, out on the tundra there, too, if we can reuse those, those balloons. When you think of the cost, though, you've got to consider, too, that there's cost in the helium gas and there's cost in the shelter where they do the balloon inflation. So... You know, nothing's as cheap as you think it should be. I wish I had a number for you, though. Is the weather yeah. balloon system a standardized system throughout the world? Um, the data is collected and exchanged on a standardized format such that there are mandatory levels in the vertical where you have to report data, and those are exchanged internationally. In answer to your question, though, is... Like, does everybody by international agreement have to use exactly this kind of instrument? I don't think that's the case. There are different people who make these balloon, uh, these instruments, and I think that, that that is not as standardized. In fact, they're working toward going toward a uh, weather balloon data gathered by GPS, that, that, that the instrument would have an onboard GPS receiver and would know where it was by GPS, and that would offer even more precise measurements of the wind because you assume that any horizontal motion of this instrument is due to it being pushed by the wind, and so when you have more precise location information, you know the wind better. So that's coming on board. So the instruments are always changing. I don't think there's an international requirement that they all be the same, as long as the data is good. That's the impression I get. Again, so when we go to a site, they'll show both centigrade, Celsius, and Fahrenheit, and mm -hmm. kilometers per hour and miles per hour. Right. Well, you know what, though? Like... Um, this is a good question. Here in the United States, we, we still use some of this goofy English stuff. So we report wind. I'm not making this up in knots. You know what a knot is? Nautical mile an hour. Um, that's 1.15 regular human miles an hour. So it does pay attention to, to watch your units. And um, here's where the miracle of the Internet comes in, though. Because there is a standard in upper air data is reported in vertically um, in meters. And so I went... I had to convert from meters to miles above the ground, and on the internet, just Google um, unit converter, and there's all kinds of great sites out there where you can convert, you know, inches to 
meters or kilograms to pounds and all those kinds of things. So the units issue is becoming less in an, of an issue, but still enough to make us miss Mars now and then. Does the high and low in the weather change in the weather change every season? Do high and low pressure systems change through the season? Well, yeah, here we are in, uh, on our part of the world, as long as you're not real close to the equator, you get up into these latitudes, you have those high and low pressure systems that transition, they tend to go from west to east across um, Alaska and the Pacific Ocean and into the lower 48 states. And in the summertime, it tends to be a little bit less active. In the wintertime, that's when you get stronger low pressure systems. You know, in western Alaska, the, the fall is the stormiest time of the year. Right now can be the stormiest time of year. Before the Bering Sea gets covered up with ice, then when that open water is able to put moisture and, and comparatively warm air into the bottom of the atmosphere, yet the upper part of the atmosphere is getting colder and you have cold air coming off of Russia as well. That's a recipe for really strong storms. So through the course of the year you see that high and low pressure systems do tend to change. They're a little stronger in the fall and in the winter and they're a little bit weaker in the summer and in the spring here in Alaska. What is the signal strength or range of the instrument? If the wind is blowing it away, how far before you will not get a signal? The signal strength, that's a really good question. The strength is, I don't think, as much of an issue as if it blows really far away. If you have really strong winds starting off just off the ground, I mean, there are times when the balloon is ripped out of your hands, boom, it goes, like if you were, have a blizzard in Nome and you launch a balloon, and it starts moving, and there's no light winds at all, that the balloon can actually be carried over the horizon, and it gets below the horizon of the Earth, and so then you can't hear it anymore. That's the limitation that I've heard about. Um, another fact, so in answer to your question, I'm not sure how far away it, it can get before you can't hear it. I don't think that's a limiting factor. The only trouble is when it, if, if strong winds carry it over the limb of the Earth, then you can't, you have no line of sight anymore, and you can't hear it then. Another issue, though, is the frequency that you use. I couldn't quote you off the top of my head exactly what frequency it is, but inside the box here, if you were to take this out, there's a, you can go in there with a screwdriver and change the frequency that this transmits at, and that's important because I mentioned earlier that our balloons have to get up to a, at least a few miles high, otherwise you have to launch it again if it pops too early. Well, let's say that happens. Sometimes you launch a balloon, and it gets one of those slow leaks, and it gets up there and it just kind of hovers. It's maybe only two or three miles high, just, uh, just sitting there. And you go, well, darn it, that's no good. i got to do another balloon. Well, now you can't put another transmitter up there that's set at the same frequency because you won't know what you're hearing. So that's when you need to tune. You get out your screwdriver and with this new radio sound that you're cooking up, you change the frequency on that one to make it very distinct from the other guy who's just sitting up there and, and sending you bad data. So you do have to be aware of the frequency that you're using. And I would, I would speculate, I don't really know this, but certain frequency are, reser are reserved for certain purposes. And there's a little tiny bit of the spectrum, which is for the weather balloons. Because we would never, it's not like you're listening for your weather balloon and you would catch uh, the radio station. You know, that wouldn't happen. So our frequencies are in a narrow area reserved for these things. That's my impression. When talking about the jet stream, how low can it get and, and how high do we talk about? Ah, well, you know, the jet stream, we didn't even know there was a jet stream until uh, World War II when the United States developed a big bomber fleet and we were flying bombers to go drop bombs on Japan and they would hit these 100 mile an hour headwinds and they're flying up at 30,000 feet above ground and would encounter it. So the jet stream is a high elevation phenomenon. We didn't even know about it until just say 70 years ago. So that's very, or 60 years ago. So it's a very new thing. There are rare cases where the jet stream can descend and even hit the surface of the earth. That's pretty rare. Um, in a strong storm that can happen. But ask any mountain climber who's going to go up Denali. You know, maybe the jet stream doesn't come down to earth, but sometimes the earth goes up to the jet stream. The top of Denali is 20,000 feet, and that's getting to be the elevation where you can start to, to feel the jet stream. And sometimes climbers in, on extreme high mountaintops can be hit by the jet stream. It's a comparatively narrow ribbon of wind, too. You know, the jet stream might be going across like a little snake across the hemisphere. It makes a loop. Actually, if you were to look at the Earth from the pole, the jet stream makes kind of a loop around. And it, it has little undulations in it, but it comes back on itself. 
as a loop. And to the north and to the south of that little high-speed river of air, the wind speed at the same elevation can be very light. It just seems kind of a freaky thing. It's uh, very distinct. It's like a, a ribbon, a, a distinct river of air high up in the atmosphere. And um, so its location tends to be way above the ground, and it's, it's also discrete in the horizontal direction, too. If you're climbing Denali, there are days when there's no wind up there, even at 20,000 feet. But then if the jet stream wanders over and hits you, it's like standing in a fire hose, a 100-mile-an-hour wind. Very tough to climb the mountain. And that's one reason they tend not to climb the mountain in the wintertime, when the jet stream's more active. And that, you know, that gets back to the question asked earlier about do high and low pressure systems, do they change through the year? And yes, the highs and lows are stronger in the fall and winter, and so is the jet stream. The jet stream's stronger in the fall and winter, too. And so it's, if you're going to climb Denali and you don't want to get hit by a really strong jet stream, it's better to go, say, in the late spring or in the early summer. That's when the jet is at its weakest. Maybe, Eric, you can uh, give us a little information. If any of these students, say, were interested in science or weather science, what's open to them or what should they do? Well, to be interested in the sciences. Well, you know what? I think maybe one of the big issues there is interest and curiosity and you know, think for yourself. The neat thing about science is that it is a repeatable process. If somebody tells you, like you flip a coin, what's it going to be? Heads or tails, right? And uh, somebody says to you, well, because it's heads or tails, if you flip a coin ten times, what you'll get then is five heads and five tails. That's the way it has to be. And then you think to yourself, well, I don't know if that's true. I mean, sure, maybe that, maybe that would work, but you could flip a coin ten times and get six and four, couldn't you? The neat thing about science is, if you ask yourself a question, you can just go find the answer. Do an experiment. Try to find things out. And science, ideally, the results of an experiment are duplicatable. That is, you say to your friend, hey, you know what, I flipped a coin ten times and I got this. What did you get? And you can compare your results and that, that this process of investigation will get you a little bit closer to truth. Science is pretty fun. That's, I think, one thing to, to stay with if you want to get in the sciences is to maintain curiosity and remember that it's fun. It's not supposed to be drudgery. It's not supposed to be, uh, I did it because I had to do it. If you want to be in the sciences, you better really want to be in the sciences. But it's, it's a fun world. And I remember a chemistry teacher I had who always said, he would say, chemistry is an experimental science that studies the world around us, which is not maybe the most inspiring bumper sticker you've ever uh, encountered, but I, that always stuck with me because I liked the way that it implied that we can touch the world through science. It's just the world's all around us right now. Like when I was a kid, one reason I think I'm in weather today is that I was in English class one day looking out the window, and there were two layers of clouds. One like one cloud was going this way, and then there were clouds going this way too. And I thought, well, what's going on up there? How come aren't those clouds cooperating with each other? What are they doing? And science really is all about kids who look out the window and wonder why something happens. When I was growing up in North Dakota and there's a blizzard outside for two days and you just look out the window and all you see is white like that and you wonder how did this happen because two days ago it was blue sky, it was totally different. What's going on? And that's the seed I think of, of any, um, if you want to have a career in the sciences, is just asking a lot of questions and being not afraid to uh, think for yourself. Where do all folks have different names? Why do clouds have different names? This gets back to Latin, the, the mother of all languages. And, uh, you know, in the sciences, they got to categorize everything. And the names that you hear of clouds refer to some basic characteristics of clouds. Like you might have heard the term um, alto cumulus or alto stratus. And what do those things mean? Well, those are Latin terms that describe the, the, word, the cloud, like alto cumulus. Alto means mid-level, so they're like 10,000 feet off the ground. And then cumulus means accumulation or a lumpy cloud, a, a vertically developed cloud. So the clouds have different names because there are different kinds of clouds and you want to call them something. But then when you, you see the different structures of the different clouds and they have these different names, the different kinds of clouds indicate that different things are going on in the atmosphere. Like in the summertime, when you have a thunderstorm, that's from one of those big vertically cumulonimbus, a vertically developed cloud. And there's that a Latin term there, cumulonimbus, uh, a vertically developed rain cloud. And so the names reflect the fact that there are different kinds of clouds, and there are different kinds of clouds because there are different processes at work in the atmosphere. The, 
produce those clouds. So the names are useful. You, you can tell a lot about the weather um, if you know it's clear or cloudy, but you can tell even more about the weather if it's cloudy and you know what kind of cloud it is, because only certain types of weather phenomenon will produce certain kinds of clouds. So that's helpful. You know, a really good example of that, here's a name for you, is Alto Cumulus Standing Lenticular. That's a good name. And when you have that kind of cloud, in, in the interior, that means Chinook winds through the mountains. Those are the clouds that look like flying saucers over uh, the Alaska range. And, he, and in Delta Junction, just down the road from Fairbanks here, they can have all kinds of wind. The wind is roaring through Isabel Pass there, and it gets windy in Delta. And when that wind happens, you tend to have these, these cappy-looking clouds that are hovering over the mountaintops. They look like a stack of dinner plates, maybe, or flying saucers hovering there. The Latin name for that is Alto Cumulus Standing Lenticular, which is a big mouthful there. Although the word lenticular has the same root as the word lens, they almost look like contact lenses too, those clouds. And so lens and lenticular, they have that same, same name. So the name of a cloud can tell you a lot about what's going on. If you put uh, the balloon starts from the ground in cold weather and one in warm weather, is there a difference in the speed of the rise of the balloon? <coughs> Wow. <laughs> I will say that it would go faster in the cold weather because there'd be greater density contrast. Cold air is denser and the, the balloon would be less, it, the contrast would be greater. It'd be more of a gap in density from the inside the balloon to the outside in the cold air case, so it would squirt up faster, being squeezed harder, and so it would squirt up faster. That's my, am I right? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I've never had to answer that. You're one the before. expert. Well, you know, sometimes you just don't know. See, this is why we got to do an experiment. We got to find out. We got to launch two exactly similar balloons, and the only thing different about it is the outside air temperature, and see who goes faster. That'd be a good way to go. But you know what? It's it's hard to. If in order to do an experiment like that, you'd have to have the balloons exactly the same. And when we fill the balloons up, I mean. We have a certain amount of gas in there, but we don't measure it to the millimeter, you know, the gas. It's a, it's a rough ballpark. But so if you were looking for a very subtle signal, you'd have to have very precise balloons, which we're not really set up to do oh. in that sense. So Ruby what do you movie. do about the weather, uh, predicting weather over the ocean then? Does it go um, off boats? Yeah, there are, there are ship reports, which are nice. You know, in, anytime you they predict They have the balloons weather, that you give them? No, that's pretty rare. It would just be maybe some Navy ships or NOAA research vessels would be launching balloons. Um, like a, a Toyota, a, a ship carrying a bunch of Toyota cars from Japan to San Francisco would not launch weather balloons. But they would give you surface data. They would say, oh, around us at this moment, the wind is from the north and it's 55 degrees and the air pressure is such and such. And that's important to have. But um, also we have, oh, airplanes though. Uh, transcontinental there, aircraft, yeah. they are getting, there's more and more automated onboard weather data on jet aircraft, and that's getting, that's so useful. And satellites, too. S weather satellites do a crude version of a vertical profile of the atmosphere, but they measure from the top down. And they can see what's going on in different levels of the atmosphere, but it's very coarse. It's, it's not as good as a balloon, but it's, it's getting better all the time. Problem with that, though, see, it's a continued high bias problem or high latitude bias oh, right. is they don't work poleward of like 60. So that means north of say Anchorage's latitude they don't work at all because those those are satellites that are hovering over the equator and they just can't really see up over there. But that's those are those satellite bound sounders. But the neat thing about that is you got the middle of nowhere in the Pacific and those so satellites they, they can fill in some of those gaps. Satellites are nice. They're spatially comprehensive. So that when we're watching the aviation weather, they have the satellite image. It's being, uh, you're, you're, we see the satellite image, but they're using the information they get from the weather balloons. No? Um, both, you know, there's, there's no one instrument platform that tells you everything. You got to look at all the, there's radar, there's balloons, there's satellites, there's um, ship observations, there's out at the airport, they have the official temperature, there's all those platforms. Right. And that helps piece together enough of the atmosphere that you can then fit a conceptual model that, oh, this is happening because of that. Um, so there's, you need, there's no one thing that you can get away with only having that one platform. You need them all. Um, on the TV show in Alaska, when you see a satellite, yeah. like in uh, any TV meteorologist, especially if it's a movie loop going behind them and they say, oh, and you can see the storm in the Great Plains, that that's usually a satellite loop carried that's one of those 
equator satellites it's hovering oh, okay. over the equator yeah. up here in alaska weather though sometimes what you see is a different kind of satellite that covers all of alaska and that's a polar orbiter and the giveaway from those though is it's one single image and it doesn't move in time um, but those are satellites that orbit like this i'd like to thank you all for attending uh, with right. eric stevens talk and we look forward to seeing you again next month and I'd like to say goodbye bye bye <laughs>